All right, let's take just a moment together. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our message for today. Father, we're so very thankful for the ways that you encourage us, the way that you help to equip us and show us the, the things that you want us to do. We pray that you'd help us to have a measure of dedication to you such that we would never question. Instead, that we would uh, jump at the opportunity to be able to serve. Pray, Lord, that you would bless the efforts that we make so that things that we do would be honoring to you and be beneficial to those who are around us and increasing your kingdom. We pray, Father, that you'd help us to understand exactly what you require of us, that we would surrender to the authority of your word and allow you to do your good work in us. Thank you again for the graciousness you've poured out, your love and kindness upon us through the sacrifice of Jesus, and we pray this in his name. Amen. I'm going to encourage you, if you would, to uh, go back with me to Paul's writings in 2 Timothy chapter 4. I've been using this as kind of the Kickstarter verse for all nine messages that I've preached in this series. This is the ninth and final message. So we're going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and following, where Paul writes, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing, and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside to myths." Well, we have examined eight different occasions where God has expressed his authority and acts of judgment have occurred. Eight different times in the Old and into the New Testament where God has shown his authority and based upon either the rebellion of an individual or a group, God has acted in a way that has underscored his authority. He will not be set aside and it's important for us to heed the warning that's found in each of those occasions, especially as we examine our own Christian faithfulness and our service to ensure we are walking within the boundaries God's created with his word, that we're being faithful and true to what God says and doing what God has asked us to do, no less and no more. We're not adding to. That being said, today's topic is one that is honestly seldom really taught in modern churches today. We're going to talk about the great final judgment. And in that teaching, there is uh, unfortunately not really a palatability with our culture. And what used to be referred to as kind of a staple in church teaching and preaching, often now as it pertains to the, the judgment, the final judgment, often it's just seldom ever referenced or maybe it's mentioned in passing and there's not a great deal of teaching on it. That does not change the reality of the need for us to understand it or the urgency of the message of the judgment that is to come. We need to understand it entirely. And we need to be able to operate under this sense of urgency that stands there because as the Bible says, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God and we will give an account. It's good to know on this side exactly what God expects of us and to obey without any question so that we can go confidently into that place of judgment. Now, that being said, let's take a moment, let's examine a few of the testimonies that are found in the Scripture. This topic is so vast and, and so uh, deep, we couldn't possibly cover it exhaustively in the time that we have for us in an assembly. So I want to encourage you to go with me, and we're going to examine a few things where the Scripture speaks. First of all, we're going to go to the testimony of the Apostle John. His revelation, a vision God provided to John. And in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 and following, John writes this. He said, I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it. You'll notice the him is a capital H. From whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. There is no escape from the presence of the authority of God. He goes further. 
I saw the dead, the great and small, standing before the throne. Books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books, according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like a very cuddly environment, does it? In this text, we find that Jesus, as we've read from Paul's testimony in 2 Timothy 4, will judge all mankind. As the title of the series says, the quick and the dead, as the King James says, or in 2 Timothy 4 in the New American, as I have read, the living and the dead. Christ will judge. Here in Revelation chapter 20, John testifies as he was being shown this vision, as he was revealed from God in the spirit exactly the scene and how it would re relate and play out John said there was a great throne and all came before him and it specifies the dead and then it further qualifies by speaking of death and Hades this is something that's not taught a lot in the church today Sadly, there's a lot of, of uh, irresponsible teaching about this. And people have an idea that, that um, when we pass, when we die, we are immediately ushered into heaven. But the Bible does not say this. If we are outside Christ, we are not immediately ushered into hell. If we are in Christ, we are not immediately ushered into heaven. Instead, we are in a spiritual place of the dead called Hades. And Hades is divided, the New Testament teaches us, between the righteous and the New uh, Testament says the unrighteous. The righteous are in a place referred to as paradise. It's often uh, cited as Jesus referred to it as the bosom of Abraham in the gospel when he was teaching on this. The unrighteous are in a place called Tartarus or torment. But it's all the place of the dead. And here the scripture specifies delineating the dead and Hades. The dead it's referring to as those who are in a condition or a place of unrighteousness. The dead in the reference given us here in Revelation refers to those who are in the spiritual place of torment for the unrighteous in the realm of the dead right now. And Hades is just a general term for all the others, those who are righteous. The Bible refers to them as being in a place of comfort and peace. Christians and saints of the Old Testament are in this place comforting one another. And the Bible in Revelation describes the scene as awaiting God's appearing in judgment or an action of judgment to come, which will completely get rid of, as John says, the place place of the dead death and Hades he testifies will be then thrown into the place we know as hell in the Bible the lake of fire Dr. Jack Cottrell refers to this as saying there is a place prepared by God for the devil and his angels but it's not open for business yet because the judgment has not occurred John's testimony speaks of what he saw. But we don't just have John. We have the testimony of a very faithful companion of Paul, a historian who wrote for us the book of Acts and who also has provided other testimony in the Gospels. In Luke's writing, in Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31, Luke says, Therefore, having overlooked times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Here we find a single reference of judgment 
as a day of judgment, not specific or personal to me, as in when I die I will appear before the throne, but instead a single day in time when God will judge all, as the Bible says, the quick and the dead, the living and the dead, the righteous and the unrighteous, appearing before God in judgment. And the Bible gives us a standard by which we'll be judged. The Bible says all will be judged by the one whom God has appointed. Jesus himself will be judging. And here's the kicker. Jesus will be the qualifier. We have to either be identified in Christ, receiving the righteousness as a benefit of what he's done for us in his sacrifice through the power of his resurrection. We have to be a Christian, as the Bible describes, or we have to be perfect just like Jesus. Now, I'm going to throw another qualifier in there. Because the Bible identifies a condition or a state of innocence that I've referred to in teaching and preaching environments like this before. I mentioned earlier a celebration or a night of life that will be coming sponsored by the Pregnancy Help Center. It highlights this type of a condition of innocence when it speaks about those who have died before given the opportunity to even be born or those who have suffered some sort of malady or some sort of an impairment, some sort of birth deficiency that would not allow them to intellectually develop the way they needed to, to comprehend what God would expect of them or what righteousness or unrighteousness, what sinlessness and sin looks like. Therefore, they couldn't understand guilt. They have no knowledge of who Jesus is or what he's done. They are in a condition of innocence and God will redeem them. But all the rest of us are measured and judged by the one God has appointed and through whom God has given authority based on his resurrection. We can also see in the words of the Apostle Paul what he says about judgment. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, one of several texts in the New Testament actually speak about this. Beginning of verse 20, Paul describes saying, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. That's the Bible's term for those who have died. For since by a man came death, we talked about that, the sin of Adam, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as Adam, in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits. After that, those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death, for he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it's evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all." There's an awful lot that's said in that text. It would be really easy to be lost in the weeds here. And listen, I'm not trying to, trying to tell you that the Scripture teaching with regard to the judgment is an easy thing to understand. I'm not going to suggest that there are not differing ideas or arguments or approaches to this text. I'm not going to tell you that there isn't a great deal of confusion here. What I will say is all the above applies. But I will also say God intends for there to be one meaning. As he writes or as he reveals, he is revealing one message. In other words, he's not revealing to this denominational group one thing and to this denominational group another and to those who are outside Christ something else. He reveals one message and it is our challenge to understand what God has said or what God has revealed. And if ever there exists a contradiction in my understanding what the Bible says, it is not because God has created confusion or because God has contradicted contradicted himself, it's because there's a confusion in my mind or in my thinking pertaining to the teaching. So the challenge, the effort, 
is to put in the work to understand in light of the context of individual passages as well as the light, the overall broad teaching on the subject from Christian faith in the scriptures. It's our job to rightly understand and walk within that understanding. God does not intend for there to be confusion. But oh my goodness, how our enemy does. Our enemy, the Bible says, is the father of lies. He is legitimately the author of confusion. He wants to trip us up on basic doctrinal teachings, let alone deeper theological things. If he can cause us to be tripped up in small details, he's won the battle in the greater details. So creating confusion is always a part of his goal. But we have the perfect, the word, delivered once for all available to us. Number one selling book on the list of books since the beginning of that list every day, every year since then. More Bibles are bought and sold than any other published work in the history of mankind. We don't suffer for lack of Bibles. We suffer for lack of Bible reading or lack of Bible understanding. So listen, it's important for us to know what God teaches on this because we've seen eight previous occasions where God has revealed and shown his authority and he's already cautioned us in just what we've read this morning. His authority is yet to be expressed at the judgment. Now from these texts we can see several things that we must pay note to. Before the judgment, we now know Jesus must return. We also know there is an order of, of events surrounding the judgment that we have to be able to grasp and expect. We also need to understand the Bible describes consistently a setting or a scene of corporate judgment. That does not mean we'll be wearing a business suit. That means we each will stand in the greater audience. In other words, as the Bible testifies, all our sin will be laid bare. Now that's awkward. That's embarrassing. I've had people tell me when I've taught this before, I cannot stand the idea that God will allow all my sin to be revealed before my parents. Well, listen... He's not going to just reveal this before your parents. He's going to reveal it to every one of your kin and all your neighbors, people that love you, people that hate you. And there's a reason why he does it. God's justice is so rich, deep, full, and perfect. His love for us is so deep and unending. He does not allow a single sin to go unnoticed or untouched because a single sin impairs us from being in his presence. He allows our sin to be laid bare and identified so that for our purposes, we will recognize we are not righteous and able to stand in his presence apart from what God has done. Secondly, it highlights to everyone else, we are not alone. We're all in the same boat. And lastly, it glorifies God because he has, before the foundation of the world, provided a sacrifice sufficient to cover the debt of our sin. Now listen, I'm not challenging you. I'm not laying down the paper to say, let's list our greatest sins. What I'm saying is there is not a single sin that cannot be covered by the blood of Jesus. And for it to be covered, it has to first be revealed. Scripture is evident in what it says that at the end of judgment, there are one of two options. It is at that point we are redeemed, we are purchased back, and our sin is paid for. Now, some would argue this and say, no, 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 we're redeemed now. Listen, we sing songs about being redeemed, and it's true. It is a promise God has made contingent based upon our faithfulness to Him. So long as we are in Christ, we are redeemed. You can think of this like a marriage. 
So long as you are faithful to your spouse, so long as you are walking within your vows, you're married. But if someone is so brazen as to ignore those vows and to breach or break or humiliate their spouse, that could end in the marriage. Doesn't have to, but it could. God gives the same idea when he speaks about Jesus being the groom and the church being his bride. We are called to faithfulness, to obedience. And so long as we are compliant and walking in, even if we breach or err, if we return in terms of the lordship of Jesus in our life, we have the promise of his redemption. The Bible says God gives us the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as a promise of that redemption. It's a promise of something yet to come. Jesus must return. There are events which must occur. Must occur. We will stand in a corporate audience. It will not be secret. It will not be spiritual. It will not be individual. It will be corporate. And then we are either redeemed or we are rejected based on our status in Christ. Let's talk about this then. What does the Bible say with regard to the return of Jesus? Now, listen, I, I want to clarify a couple things here. Um, I'm teaching from the New American Standard Version of the Bible. I've done this for now over 25 years. I've used this Bible and other copies of it in the New American Standard Version. It's become my preferred Bible. Doesn't mean it's better or less than others. It's just the one that I prefer. And I, I feel it to be accurate based on what I understand. I use it exclusively in my personal Bible study and then I will accent it with other versions, other uh, translations, and look to see kind of the variants. But this is exclusively the one that I use with almost no exception. In this new American Standard Bible, in the New Testament alone, there are 184,603 words just in the New Testament. They make up 7,959 verses, which are then structured in 206 chapters in the New Testament. Do you know the return of Jesus is mentioned 318 times in the New Testament? That averages out to be one in every 25 verses in the New Testament. I'm going to suggest to you that the return of Jesus apart from the resurrection of Jesus, is the single most important doctrinal teaching or doctrinal thing we can grasp because in it we have the assurance based on his resurrection that we will be redeemed, we will be forgiven, we will stand in his presence, God will bring justice. I want you to understand this because there was a great deal of confusion about this in the time of the apostles' writings even, and there's confusion which exists even today. Paul wrote two letters to the Thessalonian church, and the church at Thessalonica suffered from this type of confusion. In 2 Thessalonians, last week I referenced this, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, the apostle Paul was writing with regard to the confusion concerning the return of Jesus. You see, in the first century, Christians were awaiting the appearance of Jesus so urgently, they expected within their lifetime to see Jesus return. His promise was he would go away and he would return. The problem was that in God's timing and our timing, there's often some sort of, of a, a variance there. We expect God to operate on our time when God continues to operate on his. They were urgently awaiting the appearing of Jesus and we should live that way. But they were doing so to an extreme such that they said, Jesus can return today so I don't have to pay my taxes. Or I don't need to mow the yard or feed the pigs or whatever had to be done. I don't really owe this debt. And they were becoming irresponsible about, about uh, irresponsible, blah, blah, I sound like Porky Pig. They were becoming irresponsible about it, such they fell under the condemnation of the Apostle Paul. In, uh, I believe it's 1 Thessalonians 3.10, Paul gave a statement that is, uh, no, 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 3.10. Paul writes a statement that I've cited, others have cited as well. Speaking of those who are slothful and lazy, he said, if a man will not work, he's not to eat. 
It's a Christian value that still holds today. Do you know the context within which that directive was given? It's because Christians were laying back and so lazy and slothful about how they were living that they were being irresponsible. And so Paul said, listen, if you don't take care of your daily business, don't expect the church to carry you. How urgent is the understanding of the return of Jesus? It is the single most important doctrinal teaching other than the resurrection in the entire New Testament. And there was confusion in the New Testament in the first century world, and confusion about it abounds even today. People think about the end time or judgment, and we hear the context of what Jesus said in his conversation at Olivet in Matthew 24, where he referenced his appearing in, in judgment and an action of authority specific to the destitute nature of the Jewish structure, the coming destruction that would fall upon Rome, which took about 400 plus years, the things Jesus was referring to, and he said, you're going to hear rumors. You're going to hear about wars and rumors of war and famines and earthquakes. You're going to hear about nations rising and kings rising. But that isn't my return. In the Thessalonian church, they were thinking the same thing, such that they were thinking, have we missed the return of Jesus? What about Christians who've died? What will happen to them? And Paul had to write and clarify to them. That was in the first century. Today, in modern times, people still hear the context of Matthew 24. They want to apply it now, and they say, oh, things are so bad now. Jesus must be right there ready to come back. When we consider the moral condition of our culture, or some based upon their ideas of end times, look at Israel and America. Listen, the return of Jesus has nothing to do with America, has nothing to do with Israel, has nothing to do with wars or rumors of war, or famines or earthquakes, nations or kings. It entirely falls upon the providence of God, period. Jesus himself said the Son of Man doesn't know when he will return. And if we rip from Matthew 24 this idea that Jesus is giving signs about his coming, listen, the signs clearly are talking about that destitution that would happen at the temple. It has nothing to do with his appearance. As I said last week, his disciples never expected him to leave. How could they have possibly expected him to come back at the time of that writing? Jesus is clear in his teaching. The New Testament is clear about its teaching. It's urgent for us to make sure we understand it because it's the source of our hope. Jesus will return. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 1, after he had said these things to his disciples, this is the scene of his ascension, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him on their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothes, uh, clothes stood beside them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This Jesus, who's been taken up from you into heaven, will come just the same way as you watched him go into heaven. The Bible's clear here. It is not as the Bible references in other places, the idea of coming on the clouds, spoken of in Daniel, spoken of in Revelation. That speaks of a different scene. It began with this. It is not Jesus returning, it's Jesus going. And here in Acts 1, the angels who are there said to the disciples as they stood astonished and dumbfounded, not expecting Jesus to leave, they said, why are you here just gawking at the sky? You just saw Jesus personally leave, physically leave, directly leave. He will return in the same way. Let's go a little further. Mark 16, Mark testifies, verse 19 and following. So then, when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. This is such a powerful teaching, it was used to confirm the next apostle. They said they had to be present, a witness of Jesus being first discovered, reviewed, uh, reviewed as the Son of God at the beginning of his ministry, all through the time he ministered and taught, all the way up to the very time Jesus ascended. They had to be a witness to see Jesus going so they could testify about his return. 
This is how significant and this event must happen for Jesus to return in order for the judgment to take place. How do we know that? 1 Thessalonians, again from Paul's writings, chapter 4, verses 13 and following, Paul writes this, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. Remember, they were confused, thinking the Christians who died, they must be lost. Either we miss Jesus coming back, or they're gone. They're, they're just not in. Paul said, I don't want you to be uninformed about those who passed on, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe Jesus Christ uh, died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Now, to kick out another idea of another very heavily influenced idea of the end times, there's a teaching that says Jesus is going to bring the church back with him from heaven. If you start adding up all the different resurrections that are going to occur there, I went to a, a funeral one time where a preacher preached and I, I am not kidding you, he showed in the scripture, he thought, four different times when the church would be resurrected. That is Oscar Mayer material. Be lonely. The Bible speaks of a resurrection which occurs. The Bible says he will bring with him. That with means simultaneous to his appearing, simultaneous to his return. At his return, uh, return they will be resurrected and in his presence. Not coming from heaven with him. You see, as we already know, and the New Testament teaches in several different places, the dead are still in a spiritual place of the dead. They will not be resurrected until Jesus has returned. People are dying and being buried every day. That place still exists. Because remember what John said in Revelation? After Jesus returns and judges, death and Hades are cast into hell. How do we know Jesus hasn't returned? Paul references it to the Thessalonian church. Death still occurs. The resurrection hasn't occurred. Therefore, Jesus has not yet returned. He goes a little bit further. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain will not, uh, until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself, the Lord himself, just as he did in Acts 1 when he left, when he ascended into heaven on the clouds, as Daniel testified seeing the Son of Man doing, as John testified seeing the Son of Man doing, ascending into the presence of God on the clouds after leaving behind the disciples, he then was coronated king, granted a kingdom, the church, given authority over all things. And the Bible, as we've already read, says he will reign until he's put the last enemy under his feet. He didn't just do that when he resurrected. There is a time coming when literally death and Hades will be cast into hell. He says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven. How? Unnoticed? By a specific few in a small geologic location? No. It says he will descend with the shout, the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. You see, we have hope and peace and assurance based on the assurance of his resurrection and therefore the assurance, the promise of his return. Personally, physically, loudly, universally, all eyes will see him. It will not be hidden or spiritual or restricted to a geological area. Everybody from the dead to the living will know the instant Jesus returns. Let's go a little further here. At the judgment. Following Jesus' return and the great and glorious resurrection of all and our changing, if we're alive at his appearing, we're changed, the Bible says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, then we are judged. Hebrews 9, 27 says something we're very familiar with. Inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sin of many, will appear a second time, for salvation, without reference to sin, to those who eagerly await him. This is Jesus' glorious appearing for the purpose of redeeming his church. Matthew chapter 25 describes that scene, if you've ever read it, when it speaks about the scene of the sheep and the goats and that Jesus will divide based on his judgment those who belong to him and those who do not. The judgment will be shocking because those who are guilty say, oh, but don't we deserve? And he will say, no, I don't know you. 
And those who have been given the promise of redemption, they'll say, we don't deserve it. And he said, oh, but I bought it for you. We're either redeemed or rejected at that point. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 says, as we've read earlier, then, after Jesus' return, after the resurrection, at the judgment, then comes the end, the culmination of all things. The Bible describes this as saying the very elements, the earth itself will be destroyed in fire. It says Jesus will return in fire. His angels with him to gather from every area, even the sea and those who perished in other ways, everyone gathered into his presence after the judgment. Then the end comes. And Jesus, having reigned, we talk about this as a thousand year reign. That's the Bible's general term of a reign that Jesus is in. It's the church age. We're in his kingdom reign right now. And you know that as a citizen of the kingdom? Jesus is our Lord and King. He reigns with authority and power now. The only thing Jesus doesn't have knowledge of is when God's going to say, go get him. At that point, he will hand the kingdom over to the Father. People trip on this. They don't realize what's happening here in terms of glorification of God and the exaltation of Jesus at the same time. Jesus speaks of this as saying at this point, he will then be glorified in us. You and I who are redeemed at that point are providing glory and honor to him and recognition to God for his sacrifice. He will hand the kingdom over to God having abolished all rule and all authority and power. He must reign until he's put all enemies under his feet and the last enemy that will be abolished is death. This is not a spiritual statement alone. It is a physical statement. Jesus physically died. Jesus was physically buried. Jesus physically resurrected. Jesus physically left. The Bible says he will physically return. We will be physically changed and death and the place of the dead will no longer hold any sway or power. It holds no sting now because we have the promise. Do your worst. It's not as good as what Jesus has done. But we will all go to the grave or be alive at the appearing of Jesus, and death will be forever abolished. The Bible's clear here. No signs of the appearing of Jesus. The signs Jesus gave, gave in Matthew's gospel testify to an appearing of a time of judgment and authority being expressed over Israel, or Judaism specific, and Rome later. And it talks about Jesus slaying his enemy with the words of his mouth, the gospel, which gutted the Roman Empire because of persecution that began in AD 70 in great, great extreme. No signs. It'll come suddenly, as Jesus said, like a thief, or as in the days of Noah, when we least expect it, it will come. It will be universal. Everyone of every language and ethnicity, of every financial standing, of everyone who's ever lived will know and see the appearing of Jesus at the same time. He will be glorified, and the Bible speaks of the shout of the angel, the trumpet of God, being surrounded with glorious, powerful angels as he returns and embracing his church as they arise to meet him. And lastly, it will be Jesus himself who will be gathering us into his fold. What does that mean for us then? Before I conclude, I just want to read one more text from Revelation, from John's writing, Revelation 22, verses 11 and following. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong. And the one who is filthy still be filthy. And let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness. And the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Behold, Jesus says here, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Let me ask you. 
Where are you in light of the Lordship of Jesus? Are you still wallowing around in the filth of your own unrighteousness and perception of self-righteousness without Jesus, without being obedient to the clear terms he has given, or have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? Have you been buried in the likeness of Jesus in the watery grave of baptism as a proclamation of your faith in him alone to remove your sin and to cleanse you? Has he infilled you with that promised Holy Spirit as a pledge of a redemption yet to come in his appearing? Listen, Jesus said, I'm coming quickly. He will come at a time you do not expect. Are you prepared today in every occasion? All eight that I've covered God has given an opportunity for repentance, and today he gives you that opportunity. Don't let it pass. Let's pray together this morning. Our Father, we glorify you for your great love. We marvel at your grace, and we are humbled at the sacrifice of Jesus to redeem us. How we long for your appearing, how we await as do others, for the great and glorious day of your judgment, for the revealing of our sin to the glory of Christ and his righteousness so that in Christ his righteousness will shine. How we long for the day when you will redeem us from that sin, never to be stained, never to be marred or scarred or held back again. How we long for the presence of death, the suffering and separation which occurs to be forever abolished from man and your presence. How we long for the appearing of Jesus and your right judgment to be given. Help us today to be found in compliance with the Lordship of Jesus so we can have that hope, that assurance at his appearing. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.